to Somerville Live Wire, a bi weekly program covering issues in Somerville. I'm Mary Ellen Muir. Somerville Live Wire is a production of the Somerville News Garden Project of the Boston Institute of Nonprofit Journalism, also called BINGE, and the Somerville Media Center. BINGE provides organizational support to community publications, runs reporting collaborations and civic initiatives, trains promising journalists, and produces bold independent journalism. The Somerville News Garden is a grassroots effort to stop Somerville from turning into a news desert, a municipality that no longer has professionally produced news outlets. Initiatives include the recently launched Somerville Wire News, journalism classes for Somervillians this summer, and this program. I've lived in Somerville for more than 20 years. With other Somervillians, I've been an organizer for the News Garden since its inception and a president of the Binge Board of Directors. So today's topic is about the restaurant situation here in Somerville. On March 1st, the rest of Massachusetts decided to advance to phase three, step two of its reopening plan. Restaurants were allowed to move from 25% capacity to 50%. Dining outside began March 22nd with restaurants in the North End waiting until April 1st. Bars are still closed. The mayor of Somerville decided to remain in the limited phase three step one stage or 25% capacity. And out of 253 cities and towns in the state, the only one to do so was Somerville, which is described by health experts as a cautious approach. As of April 5th, some restrictions in Somerville have begun to ease. Restaurants can stay open beyond 9.30 PM, but must remain at 25% indoor capacity. The city is working with creation facilities to expand their operations as well. For example, the Somerville Museum will be allowed to open but must adhere to capacity limits. To discuss these issues, we're very pleased to announce that we have um, Nishant Kishore, a fourth year PhD student from Population Health Sciences studying infectious disease epidemiology. His research focuses on better understanding how human mobility affects how diseases move between and within populations. We also have Stephen Mackey, the president and CEO of the Somerville Chamber of Commerce. Starting at the chamber in 1995, Stephen has been instrumental in reframing Somerville for regional transit and the global urban resurgence, represents Somerville businesses, employers, property owners, and developers, and has helped advance Somerville as a metropolitan dining and nightlife, nightlife destination. Stephen is a graduate of Somerville High School and Harvard University and is a Somerville resident. So given the state of restaurants, we thought that for this inaugural show that it would be good for us to talk about the current state of affairs in restaurants and what the health experts are saying in terms of um, Somerville's current status, not moving to the next phase. So we wanted to start with Stephen, if you could share with us, what is the state of restaurant opening and how are the restaurants doing? Well, Mary Ellen, uh, thank you for all you're doing in terms of journalism uh, in the urban area, particularly in Somerville. And thank you for having me on your first episode. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the dining and nightlife is, is very important to some of us uh, vitality. And we can get into that if you'd like. Uh, but we've been working with the city and the community to try to be the best uh, there is in terms of uh, health and safety. Uh, and that's on top of being a great dining and nightlife destination. Um, we've been doing this for 13, 14 months now. Um, we believe Somerville is the most attractive place to be. We are a bit frustrated that we're behind uh, a step or two behind the rest of the state in terms of regulations. So um, as far as um, the, the state of restaurants right now, are you aware of any that are not open? Um, according, um, no, we, what, it's difficult to follow because they will, we know that some have closed for a couple of days for whatever reason. Um, some have closed for the season and haven't yet opened. 
you know, we were expecting them to reopen. And um, others are, you know, we're learning every day. They were closed for the season and, and they, they are getting back outside and starting again. So it's, it's very difficult to keep a handle on it. Right. So, but we have outdoor dining now and that yes. seems to be booming. Yes, um, it's all weather dependent. Um, and um, it seems like it's, um, it, it's looking up, although there's a couple of days that are uh, treacherous in the next week. Uh, but uh, it is at the mercy of, of the weather. Okay, so Nishant, would you share with us um, any data that you have about Somerville and how it compares to the state or how is Massachusetts doing? Um, what's the lay of the land right now? Uh, hi, Mary Ellen. Uh, Mary Ellen, thank you again for having me on. Um, and Stephen, it's really great to speak with you on here as well. Um, I, I think uh, generally speaking from the most recent data that I've been able to pull comparing Somerville to other towns that are around it, all in Middlesex County, um, it seems that we're kind of on track with everyone else. Um, what I mean by that is uh, primarily looking at things like vaccinations. Um, the priority groups of vaccinations were the elderly population um, and the percent covered uh, in Somerville doesn't seem to be dramatically different uh, than uh, the percent coverage in other areas. Um, I also wanna just highlight how incredible it is that we've gone from learning about this novel disease to having vaccines built for it in the course of a year. It's certainly one of the fastest timelines uh, out there for vaccine production. Um, and I, in many cases, uh, I think everyone is looking for a way out and, and, and to get back to this new normal. A lot of that does depend on vaccine coverage, not only within that elderly population, but as many people as we can get, um, not just in terms of herd immunity, um, but also in terms of transmission. Um, the more transmission we have, uh, the more chances we have for uh, some sort of variant to emerge or, or what have you. Um, and so in, in many different ways, um, uh, the fact that we have this vaccine so quickly um, is incredible. And, and we really do want to be able to provide enough coverage to the population um, uh, to be able to get out and, and resume, some, resume some sort of normality. So Stephen, one of the things we heard from the restaurant community um, a couple of weeks ago when the mayor first decided not to open up, um, obviously there was a, a, a hue and an outcry from the entire industry about that, um, certainly from the Restaurant Association here in Massachusetts, um, also from the Chamber of Commerce. Could you speak to the struggles that restaurants had at the time um, over the winter and um, what the situation is there in terms of restaurants opening up, the impact on their revenue and so forth? Uh, well, when we look at the restaurants and we see them out in the street and thriving, um, that's wonderful. Uh, the difficulty with the outdoor dining is it's so weather dependent and of course you can't be out there and they weren't out there in the winter time. Uh, it's difficult to plan, to protect, to hire your staff, to buy your food. Um, so the uh, outdoor, the outdoor dimension of it is a, is a, another is another challenge in terms of trying to stay alive uh, as an enterprise, as a business. Um, so one of the other things that goes unseen to most people is that. Uh, with some of them being behind uh, the rest of the Commonwealth, particularly Boston and Cambridge, is there are uh, key people in these restaurants, whether they're wait staff or uh, in the kitchen behind the scenes, uh, that really make the operation what it is and, uh, and a lot of what it is. And when there's a, a, a period like this, They've lost staff, they've lost key people to other places. Uh, it's not only the customers may go elsewhere, but their staff goes elsewhere. Um, so that's a, a double uh, a hit when it comes to people. Yeah, I have heard of cases um, like that where staff have, have left. I guess, is that a question of money? 
Um, for example, if the restaurants in Somerville were able to, um, to pay people, um, so in other words, if there was pandemic money available to pay that staff, do you think that that would be the solution? There has been uh, a striking, uh, I think no one would have predicted the level of response from the federal state government, also from the city in terms of uh, putting up cash to try to offset um, and avoid layoffs and unemployment and so forth. Um, but when a, you know, when somebody who was in the industry, any particular industry, and they look at having any kind of future in terms of the next six months or the next year, I think th their prospects might look a little better if the regulatory environment is more favorable one place than it is another place. So uh, it does not encourage, it has not encouraged people to to hold off for their uh, some of a restaurant to open. They've moved on a lot of them. Right. But I mean, they chose to work in Somerville. As you say, I agree with you that, that yep. Somerville ha is the most vibrant restaurant scene. I think it's the best city of the state, quite frankly. Um, so you would think that they would be happy to stay in Somerville if they were financially able to do so. Um, in other words, you know, they weren't working in Medford or Everett or even Boston um, because presumably they liked working in Somerville. So why wouldn't they, why would they leave um, if they were compensated? I think that uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, they can be compensated if they have an active job in another kitchen in another community versus an inactive situation here. So in other words, they might not be eligible for unemployment payments because they're uh, not technically unemployed because yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not sure about that. It's been complicated because it's gone on for so long. Mm -hmm. um, we're over a year into it. And um, so I'm not I'm not sure about that. What I do know is as recently as uh, early this afternoon, speaking to one restaurant owner, um, couldn't find uh, kitchen staff. Her part of her kitchen staff had left, and she was having real difficulty trying to fill it. You know, that's another interesting. But that's even though Somerville is still at the twenty-five percent. They're not even yes. staff. Right, and um, that that's in a place that does uh, very well. There are differences in um, restaurants, it's not necessarily a reflection on the owner or the entrepreneur, but behind the restaurant, some restaurants that have a physical setup, a menu, um, a clientele that lends itself to takeout and delivery. Uh, so they can make the transition from uh, dining in to uh, takeout and delivery. Whereas other places uh, re really don't have the menu or the atmosphere uh, or the logistics or the clientele to uh, the customer base to do takeout and delivery. And okay. then some, some have better uh, outdoor prospects. Some have really wide open, um, once you take out a couple of parking spaces, they have wide open opportunities. Others don't have a big storefront, um, don't have a lot of space to occupy outside. Um, they can have small sidewalks, which are most every place in some of them. Um, so there can be, it, it varies. So every restaurant is really facing a different problem set, a different challenge. There are some common, common elements, of course, to all of them. Yeah. So Nishant, what, is the what are the current recommendations for indoor dining? Because that's really what we're talking about. That's the, the frustration there. What are the current CDC guidelines um, nationally and um, here in Massachusetts? Well, the, the CDC is still recommending that individuals who are not vaccinated avoid uh, gatherings with other individuals that are not in the same household or that are not uh, in sort of one selected household where you can have this this bubble or this interaction with only a few people. Um, unfortunately, being indoor, uh, indoors rather, uh, 
amongst individuals who are unvaccinated is oftentimes how we've seen the disease jump from one household to another to another. Um, and, and in many cases, it's it has been the restaurant staff themselves who have ended up perhaps uh, getting um, uh, uh, coronavirus uh, becoming positive and then spreading it uh, to their families or so on and so forth. So um, in, in many situations, a lot has to do with ventilation and spacing. Um, so being able to renew the air inside, being able to open doors or windows, uh, being able to create a space where this, this aerosolized uh, virus doesn't just sort of hang in the air, but moves and is removed from a space can make a big difference. And unfortunately, it's difficult to say this is the exact standard or square footage or you know ceiling space that you need and and there's such heterogeneity or, or differences between these indoor spaces I, I'd imagine even just within Somerville that it's difficult to say this very specific way is the, is the way to move forward so again as of right now the CDC still recommends that if you're unvaccinated that you avoid these indoor gatherings and even if you are vaccinated that you avoid medium or, or large gatherings um, and one key piece of this is that we're learning how the dynamics of the disease transmission changes as people get vaccinated. Um, what's, what's important to note is that it isn't random, right? It's not as if we're randomly handing out vaccines to individuals in, a, in an area, but clumps of people get vaccinated. It might be that this household all of a sudden goes together and gets vaccinated, or, or there's small areas where there's lots of people vaccinated and other areas where it's a bit more of a desert. Um, and so as we get a better grasp of how uh, the disease dynamics change as vaccination improves, uh, we'll have more information. And, and it's certainly something that's changing on, on, definitely on a weekly basis, if not, if not on a daily basis. So anytime you see the reports coming out from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or from the CDC, uh, these updates happen very, very regularly. Um, and and it's, it's again, uh, an area of ongoing research. I, 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 even with everything going on, I, I can promise you that the goal of every researcher that's working on this is to figure out the safest way to get out of it. Um, and an important point to make here too is that at some level, the decisions that are made move from being a scientific question or a scientific decision to, to, a, to a political one. Um, and, and there was an article or an argument made very early on in the pandemic relating to this, which is that science moves at a certain pace. And more often than not, it's not a single study or a single piece of research that illuminates exactly what we're looking for, but a broad collection of studies uh, is sort of slowly getting closer and closer to the truth. Unfortunately, that doesn't mesh well with re setting recommendations on a daily or a weekly basis. And in, in, in many cases, um, it ends up becoming a political decision. It ends up becoming a decision of our elected entities to say, you know, this is what I know so far. Um, this is the this is the decision that I'm going to make. If I make the wrong one, there can be incredible political risk, and if I make the right one, there can still be incredible political risk. Um, and so, um, I, I do want to clarify that there is this sort of gap. We we can provide the best evidence and the best research, um, but at the end of the day, a researcher isn't the one that says you should definitely do this or you should definitely do that. It, it's, a, it's a continuing process and it, it transitions into this, this political decision-making uh, space. Right. I mean, the, the political leaders have to balance between the economic interests, the health interests, right. um, and, and kind of just what the people want um, within the community. So, you know, kind of getting to the science then, if Somerville is the only city out of 250 plus cities and towns. Practically speaking, how much safer are we in Somerville than any of these other cities? Well, that's uh, I, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, go right, right ahead, Ms. Sean. Go ahead. Um, I, I, was, I was going to say, you know, this is one of the um, impressing things that, that I, you know, on a daily basis, basis, a year and change into this pandemic, that I feel like it's still something that people are realizing, which is that unfortunately with something like an infectious disease, it is not just your decisions that affect whether you get sick, um, which, is, which is really difficult to manage. I think in, in many ways, we're so used to this idea that I'm in charge of everything that I do, I can protect myself from everything that I need to. And um, in, in some cases, your risk of 
catching an illness is also dependent on not just who you interact with, but who they interact with. And did they do interact with somebody else from another higher risk area or, or and, you know, as you can imagine, the chain goes on. So it's, it's, it's but, but again, given this, given this, and, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we mm -hmm. don't have um, too much more time. Sure. Um, but given that people in Somerville live in other communities, work in other communities, you know, the red line goes right through the community. I mean, I guess, you know, is it possible to measure, um, you know, this many fewer cases, you know, will result from this change, this many fewer deaths will result from this change, um, especially if Somerville opens up in a couple of weeks. I mean, what's the, you know, what's the pure scientific benefit of this decision by the mayor? Um, I, again, I, I can't uh, comment directly on the specific process that the mayor used to make the decision, but I, but I can say this, that it's, it's incredibly difficult to say that this one switch that was turned on earlier or later will save X amount of lives. But the things that we can say are what we know about the disease. We have seen even to date uh, the, the, the epidemic resurging in other locations. And there's nothing special that would make our locations any different than those other locations. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to turn back the clock once an epidemic sparks, again, it's, it's that initial period of, you know, sparking the epidemic is difficult, but once it sparks, then to go backwards means taking many steps back. So I can, I can appreciate the, 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 the difficult decision on, on both sides of this. I, I don't think it's so easy to just say this decision saved this many lives. If so Stephen, if you, I mean, you may want to react to that, but also I'd like to um, talk about practically speaking from your side, how much more revenue would Somerville restaurants get if we went from 25% to 50%, given the fact that they have outdoor dining now, uh, you know, where they, where they can have it and they still have takeout, which if, they were having. Right. If I if I may I'd talk about the, uh, the you brought up measurement um, you, measuring the regulations um, if you have difference between Medford and Somerville or Cambridge and Somerville Boston and Somerville we need to realize that uh, most places where we are in Somerville where we live or work in Somerville most of us are less than a half a mile to another city. So basically the boundary on the regulations is a half mile away. Uh, in Davis Square, you can be in literally Cambridge. In Magoon Square, you can be in Medford. Uh, there are homes in, 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 in Charlestown, in Medford, and in Cambridge that are half in those cities and half in Somerville. Uh, their yeah. front door is in one community, back door is in another. We're very, very close together. So going to work, going to shop in another regulatory environment is a very real thing. Uh, and some of, you know, it's not an island. So uh, yeah, practically, sp but, but practically speaking, um, given that, that the tables, and we only have a couple minutes left, sure. given the tables, uh, you know, still have to be six feet apart. So you may, instead of going from 25% to 50%, you only realistically may be able to go up to 30 or 35%. Yes, that's true. Uh, depends on the configuration of the restaurant and how it would be reconfigured. It also depends on whether you invested in plexiglass. There are some that invested in plexiglass so they could get over the six foot restriction or get by yeah. the six foot restriction, but they're not able to implement that because they're still at 25%. If you look at what's happening, the, um, the restaurants will get to capacity on Friday and Saturday at 25%. So going to 50% would help them on Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't get there during the week. Yeah. They're not getting to 25% during the week. Yeah. Um, so it might have a real impact of about 10 to 20% on yeah. the weekly revenue if they could go to 50% on the weekends. Yeah. Well, we are almost out of time. So I'm just gonna ask each one of you one final question, which is um, Nishant, are you dining indoors at this time? Uh, not yet. Uh, I, I'm really, really looking forward to, I'm, I'm waiting to get vaccinated uh, and meet the qualifications and then 
dine indoors. I'm a huge foodie and I love all of the restaurants in Somerville and I cannot wait to go back. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with a bated breath to be able to do that. So Stephen, how you, about Mr. yourself? Are you dining you. indoors? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I've been uh, indoors at a, a coffee shop with plexiglass and I was just indoors at a restaurant talking to the owner. I was alone at, at the table and, and we both had our masks on while we were talking. So. There you go. Well, safe practices for all of us, vaccinations full steam ahead. I'm afraid we're out of time. So I just wanna thank both of you for sharing your thoughts and expertise. I also wanna thank the Somerville Media Center for production assistance. Thanks to Binge for supporting the Somerville News Garden. Be sure to check out somervillewire.news for local news coverage. And please send your thoughts, topic ideas, and news tips to somervillewire at bingeonline.org. That's B-I-N-J online.org. We'll be back in two weeks with the next edition of Somerville Live Wire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.